Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, I think I gave a talk here a few years ago on behavioral change. Um, I like to think of topics that are topical, and I think big data has been something that uh, has been around for a number of years. But I think what we're seeing is the uh, emergence of what I'm calling creepy data. And so my talk is going to be uh, covering some of that and saying that there are alternative ways by which we can think about um, how we collect data, um, how it's used, and in particular personal data, how, um, um, how the general public can be made more aware of it and perhaps even find it useful. So what methods might we use to uh, discover what people um, really think um, about data that's being collected about them? Uh, we can ask them, um, or we can ask them to fill in surveys. But I think one approach that um, is uh, perhaps we could uh, try and use is what is called breaching experiments. And these are um, originally um, developed by sociologists, uh, no less uh, Goffman and Garfinkel. And a breaching experiment, um, the idea is to disrupt the accepted code um, of conduct and unstated um, social norms. And so some of the original experiments that were conducted in the 70s were to sit right next to um, someone when there are plenty of empty tables in a cafe. I don't know if, if any of you have done that or have had that experience or whether it's in a train. And or that you're going around the, the, the supermarket with your cart and someone comes along and takes something out of your cart and puts it into theirs. These are what are called breaching experiments. They're going against um, what's normally accepted behavior. And the idea is to observe people's reactions to when this happens. Do they become upset? Do they pretend it hasn't happened? Do they move? Uh, do they get surprised? Or do they even get outraged? And so um, this sort of gets people to, on the spot, if you like, and, and even do they question the reality of the situation. So these kinds of um, uh, breaching experiments were done in the 70s. Social psychologist Stanley Milgram uh, also conducted some of these. But I think it's an appropriate method to think about how we can get people to think about what data is being collected um, about them and whether they feel comfortable or uncomfortable um, about this. So a few years ago, um, a couple of my researchers went to a, a Kai um, workshop, which was looking at the Internet of Things and how you might engage communities. And they didn't have enough time to build something, so they thought they would do a breaching experiment. And it was at the time when quantified self was all the rage. You know, how can we measure ourselves? How can we use that data? What would we use it for? And what they were interested in was, could we do a quantified community, not just about yourself, but could we measure everything or measure something about the community at large? And so they set themselves up as a fictitious, um, com uh, um, they set themselves up as a fictitious company. Uh, and they wanted to see what people would do um, by um, running this breaching experiment. So basically, rather than quantified self, they set themselves up as quantified toilets. And the idea was that they would install a urine analysis technology in the public toilets to improve um, public health. And they wanted to spark a debate about surveillance um, technologies. How would people react knowing that when they went to the toilets, their urine was going to be uh, analyzed for all sorts of things in the name of understanding better more about that community? And would they, would they react badly? Would they accept it? So what did they do? They had two days to do this, to run this. They came up with this signage, uh, which says simply that this facility is proud to participate in the Healthy Building Initiative um, behavior uh, at these toilets is being recorded for analysis. And they put these stickers up in all of the toilets in the convention center in Toronto. And you could go to that website and find out about what was happening. Um, and th the narrative was that it would be for the benefits of society if this data could be collected, because they'd, be, they'd have a better understanding um, of the health of that uh, particular community. So they set up this fake website. Um, and that website is still there, I was surprised to see. But if you can look at it, it shows uh, the time, the identification of the toilet, the sex of the person who went to the toilet at that time, how much they deposited, um, the odor, whether there was any blood alcohol, 
uh, was whether there were any drugs detected, whether they were pregnant, and any infections. So um, to make it even more authentic, they said uh, they provided a table at this website, um, and it showed all of the great things that this new system could do compared to other um, urine analysis. So what do you think happened? <coughs> Well, um, uh, within a day, everyone had heard about it. People tweeted about it within minutes, and then it got retweeted. Uh, the conference started. There was outrage. Uh, some people really thought it um, was the case that this new system was being introduced. Hi there, James. Um, but what, we've, what they found, and I think this is what was interesting about using a breaching experiment, was a wide range of reactions to this. So some, as you might expect, showed strong disapproval, which is health advice. It does not get any creepier. Some showed concern. For example, imagine your employer could find out how hard you'd partied last night. Others showed resignation. Well, um, I'm sure the government have been collecting this data for years. Others were more voyeuristic um, and saying, I just spent the last 10 minutes watching the PP logs. Can't stop watching them. Um, and then there was humor. Some people tried to match um, people entering and exiting the toilets with the data appearing on the website. So you wouldn't have got this range of reactions if you just asked people, what do you think um, if we introduced um, um, this urine um, analysis system into all of our public toilets so we get a better sense of public health? Um, and so we also um, found that the local media, uh, or rather, um, the, as well as being tweeted and retweeted, it, um, a number of journalists uh, got interested and an article appeared in The Atlantic. Um, with my title of my talk, uh, this week the Washington Post were knocking on my in inbox to ask me would I talk about this um, talk to them, but that's another story. Anyway, I, I think what um, this breaching experiment has shown is that you can get quite a different set of reactions. Unfortunately, we've been unable to publish this work because we didn't follow the IRB ethics procedure. Um, and so even though this paper was submitted to Kai and got top marks by the reviewers because it suggested that it helps us think about data, personal data in a very different way, uh, the, um, the ACM um, reviewers Rather, the ACM program committee felt that they couldn't publish it because we hadn't followed the procedures. But that's another story. Okay, um, so that's uh, one approach by which we can start to investigate and analyze how data is being collected about us. Some of you might be aware that there's a big thing happening called AI. And one aspect of this is emotional AI. And we now know that. Um, there are lots of startup companies who are interested in, in analyzing uh, people's facial expressions with a view to understanding the emotional state that um, underlies these. So now, um, in a number of stores, faces of shoppers are being taken by their cameras and converted into biometric templates. And this is used primarily, um, or allegedly, for matching with well-known shoplifters. So that's how these cameras got set up and were accepted. But once in place, they can be used for other things. And now um, a number of companies are looking at how long you look at something, whether it's an avert or whether it's a piece of lingerie or whatever, um, and um, your responses to products. Machine learning is being used as well to classify people who are looking in milliseconds as to their gender, um, their age, and their assumed emotional state. And retailers saying, well, there's nothing wrong with this. What's wrong with us collecting data like this? After all, um, we, um, online shopping has been collecting data about uh, people's preferences, about their clicks, um, using cookies and A-B testing for a number of years, and no one's really argued against that. Although when cookies first came out, there was a lot of arguments about whether or not we should be doing this. So that's what's happening in stores. So. Um, the question that I'm raising is, are shoppers comfortable with this kind of physical tracking? Because they don't know it's happening. They're not aware that this is happening. And the same thing is now happening um, with emotional AI during job interviews. There's a startup company in London called Human, and they came into being in 2016. And they argue that they can detect subliminal facial 
expressions, those little micro twitches on, in your face that you make. Um, and from this, they can calculate um, how honest, how nervous, and how passionate an applicant is when they're answering specific types of questions. A hiring company, for example, uh, Stanford, might specify what they're looking for. Uh, I know there's admit going on this, this weekend. It might specify that what we want are students who are curious and creative. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and human can come along and take video um, footage of, of the various students or whoever's here and do data capture analysis and compile a report on each um, candidate. The hiring company can then match the results with other HR data that they might have already on them. So in this sense, no one needs to be responsible for the ethics. Since the company is just doing this, it's been asked to, they're not making a decision about whether this candidate is appropriate or not based on that. The person who is the one that perhaps um, is uh, not asked and whether they would find it comfortable is the interviewee. They're not aware that this is happening. So imagine you're sitting there having your, yes. So if they were aware, is it okay or not? Well, I'm going to come up to that, but yes, if they're aware. Because it feels really similar to companies that make you pee in a cup to do a drug test, and you know, you're know you aware of it because you've got to go pee in the cup. And, and maybe you decide, I don't want to work for a company that's going to make that decision based on this. And, Exactly. I'm wondering, I think, is that the right way to deal with this? or um, I'm not saying it's the right way. I'm just saying that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And we, as HCI researchers, uh, maybe we need to think a bit more about are there ways in which we can conduct research to see whether people are comfortable about this? Um, maybe it could be that people would feel comfortable if the interview interviewers were also asked uh, to have their facial expressions analyzed. So it became, a instead of it, just a one-way process. Um, so um, my point here is to say that this type of data is becoming increasingly um, uh, possible. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but we have maybe as, a um, as researchers have a responsibility to think about how acceptable how is this? Oh, do people feel comfortable? Sure, you could say, well, I don't want to go to Stanford because they're using that method, but maybe Stanford's the best place to come to study something. And so you are being denied going to somewhere because the institution is deciding to use this. So, yeah, I think that speaks there. So this is what I'm calling the creepy dilemma, that personalized data collection is on the rise, and there'll be other ways in which AI is being used. And I'm not saying if this is good or bad. I think you know it can be used for very good um, applications. But there'll be ever more claims being made and promulgated about how AI is better than human intelligence. So that company, Human, claim that they can analyze the micro expressions um, in ways that we as humans are, are unable to notice. And from that, to infer um, the emotions that people have. Um, and so what might happen is that what I'm calling a data divide will emerge from those who are doing tracking the data and those being tracked. And it raises societal concerns um, about what my PhD student Lydia Nicholas has said is neurological privacy. Um, this is something that, you know, it's inferring uh, what's happening, your emotions, your intent from your um, facial expressions that you may not have control or understand yourself. And this brings me on to the, the, the second part of my talk, which is, are there other approaches that we, um, as HCI or social scientists, can suggest where it embraces um, the data that's been collected and it's open and it's transparent, um, and that people are willingly um, agree to participate in the collecting of that data rather than uh, it being unwittingly being collected about them, and that they feel comfortable doing so. And this is what um, the last five years, uh, part of the project uh, research that we've been doing, which has been funded by Intel, um, which is called the Interdisciplinary Collaboration Research Institute. And we've been looking at in IoT technology, sustainable and connected cities, um, and um, how we might use sensors in the environment and with people 
um, to collect data and what we might do with it. This is just one strand of the research. As many of you know, Intel have funded many uh, centers, one of which was in London between ourselves at UCL and Imperial. So within the context of my talk, um, our starting point when thinking about this is sensing data has never been easier. Anyone can go out and get a sensor and measure all sorts of things about the environment or about um, your body. But can we make this sense data more accessible to the general public? And if so, how do we engage people um, in making sense of it? So this is um, our lab here in the picture of, of people who are working um, on the uh, Intel ICRI. So our approach, having thought about this, is to try and think of ways in which we can open up the data. How do we reveal data to the general public? That's be, what's being collected about them, um, their local environment, um, and where they go. Can we trigger curiosity rather than mistrust or fear? Uh, why is that data being collected? Where is it going? What's it going to be used for? And can we engage them um, in consciously contributing to the data rather than it being subliminally um, uh, collected? And part of our approach is to try and design very visible technology. And by this, I mean um, physical um, technology that people can notice and see what's being collected about them. So I'm going to um, go through three case studies uh, where we have developed um, different ways of collecting data and analyzing it and importantly, um, engaging uh, the general public in that collection. These are um, data about society, data that's collected in your home, and thirdly, data that's collected about tourism. So the first one is about the census. Um, every 10 years in all countries in the world, data is um, required, it's mandatory. You have to fill in one of these um, questionnaires about uh, that says all sorts of things about your demographics, about your beliefs, about how much you're earning. And the reason for this, collecting this data, is so that governments can uh, work out what's the best way to distribute funds and plan services for a community, be it housing, transportation, industry, hospitals, and so on. And in the US, um, your next one is in 2020, and apparently it's mandated by Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution. And it also determines uh, the number of seats each state has in the US House of Representatives. However, this um, thing that's been uh, happening for the last 100 years or so, it hasn't changed in terms of the instrument that's being used, apart from going online in some countries. The same questions are being asked um, all about demographics. And also, you fill this in and you don't really know where the data goes or uh, if you really are... Uh, uh, inquisitive, you can go online and try and find a PDF from the last one, but it doesn't really necessarily help you. It's designed primarily for governments. So we were asked by a working team um, in the UK, in London, who are interested in opening up the census a bit more, to think differently about how we might collect data about society and where it might go. We weren't asked to um, replace it, but to think about additional ways of doing that. And in particular, we were asked to use innovative technology um, uh, and to think rather than just this online survey. We were also asked to think about how we might address the public good. And by this, it means referring to you know, services, lighthouses, parks, libraries, and the, and the such, which are provided by the government um, for the community at large um, so that everyone can benefit. But to do this, we were asked to think about what information would people be prepared to give towards the public good. In terms of the innovative um, technology, as I said, we designed something that was very visible rather than it being just another app or an online survey. And we designed these physical installations. We've done a number of these, which was that these would appear um, in the public and that people would see them, notice them and approach them and maybe interact with them. So we designed a number of these which are, were designed at uh, waist level that people could go along and answer questions on a variety of topics um, and that there would be a certain degree of privacy um, so that people couldn't peer over and see what you were doing. And some of the topics were to do with uh, health, city life, um, trust, a sense of belongingness. And these questions and themes were discussed at length with um, the working party who wanted to change the way in which we ask questions of society. 
And we asked three types of questions. The first were direct questions, um, questions about health. For example, what blood group are you? Do you give blood? Um, have you had unprotected sex? And then there were a number of answers which they could select. The second set of questions were to do with how would you mind sharing this, the answers you give with different types of people? And these would be, would you mind sharing your answer with close friends and family? with the city council or the general public at large. So example questions here might be, does your mood change throughout the day? Do you have any hereditary conditions? How many times um, did you visit your doctor in the last year? And third type of question was, what would you like to know about other people um, and people who live in your street or the community? So ex example questions were, who's living alone in your street? Your friends' whereabouts um, throughout the day? And which local services are most used in your neighborhood? And so um, the way in which people could answer these was through um, using this new kind of physical interface. And we wanted to give feedback to people that they had actually selected an answer. Um, so we had used sliders and buttons and dials and uh, buttons that could light up to show which answer you'd selected. So after you selected your answer, it, it stayed put where it was. So the next person who came along could see what answer you gave. We were interested to see whether people would find that an invasion of their privacy, i.e. they might move the slider back, or whether they didn't really mind. Um, they were given a smart card by which to... Um, put into each of these boxes and the answers would be recorded on that so that they could then um, use those answers to compare with other people's. So the way in which it worked was that they would walk into this room, um, take a card, answer questions on these different themes, and then in the middle of the room was a uh, what we call a visualization station where they could put their card in and they could see their answers uh, relative to what other people had answered. So you could get a way of comparison, comparing rather. And the data was presented in simple um, canonical form. So it, it, for example here, how many people have had unprotected sex? You could see at that particular time what the answers were. And how many people are organ donors again? Um, at the time, it was uh, just before Christmas, so we thought we'd add another question, is what do people do with unwanted gifts? And surprisingly, uh, nearly half of them throw them away or sell them. Um, so you can sort of throw in these types of questions to see um, unexpected results. So what did the, the general public do? This was in Somerset House, which is in London, and it's um, open to the public to come in. There are lots of exhibitions going on. We, um, we put a poster up outside, but that was it. We didn't try and lure people to come in and say, look, come and use this. But people were naturally curious. They saw these uh, uh, boxes, they came in, and nearly a 1,000 people um, just started answering questions um, and spending between 10 and 20 minutes um, doing this, going back up to the visualization station to see how they compared. Some people just answered for two boxes and went away, and others did the whole five. They usually answered on their own, but then they would come back together again uh, with uh, whoever they were and discuss their answers um, and also the questions. So what did we learn um, from this uh, project where we were trying to think of a different way of asking society questions? Firstly, that people are very curious, um, and um, they... Um, very interested in that kind of data. And secondly, we didn't um, entice them, and it was very public, that they decided for themselves to have a go. They gave honest answers um, to the questions, and that they pe appeared to be in the zone when they were answering them. Um, uh, in the sense that when you go to an ATM, people will sort of just be thinking about the money that they're taking out or what they're doing there. They weren't worried about leaving the state of their physical answers for others um, to see. Uh, no one seemed to be that bothered. They, they knew that all of their answers were going to be anonymous. And as I said, groups discussed their answers. So it was more of a two-way process. It wasn't just us collecting data from them. They could think, well, why are they asking this question? Isn't this interesting? And the presentation of real-time visualizations of what everyone else had uh, answered proved to be um, a good trigger for reflection and discussion. Often when 
uh, you know, we're asking, governments ask questions or need to find something out. They don't provide that feedback or give information back to those who've given it. In this case, we found that it was a very valuable way of getting triggering um, discussion. Okay, so that was uh, data um, from collecting it from society. The second case study um, I want to um, describe is collecting data at home um, and learning a bit more about this. So it's now possible, uh, there are various smart devices to collect data about what's happening um, in terms of the environment, in terms of humidity, light, uh, noise, and so on. A few years ago, um, there was a company uh, that uh, set up the Smart Citizen to make this an open source um, toolkit that anyone could um, uh, get hold of, put it into the house, and measure what they wanted. Not only that, was that that data was then made open and available for everyone else to have a look at. And it's still there, it's called smartcitizen.me. And you could um, just set this up in your home and then have a look at what data was being collected, but also then go around and look at what everyone else who's got one of these was also collecting. And you can see that there, uh, you, know, you have measurements in NO2, CO2, and so on. What um, we found when we started to uh, introduce these, um, provide them to people, was that they were interested for a, a week or so about um, the data that was being collected. They'd go onto the website, but they didn't really understand what was causing these peaks and troughs. This kind of dashboard is quite difficult to relate back to what's actually happening in their very homes. So in our project, we were trying to think, how can we make this more meaningful and more relevant and that people get more interested or more curious in this type of data? So what we tried to do was to make the data more tangible uh, rather than it just being a website that you could go to and have a look at. And so we built these uh, what are called fizzy cubes, um, which were intended to be placed throughout the house that would indicate certain events that were happening based on the data that was collected. So the, the, citizen, um, the smart citizen device was still used to collect the data, but then we developed further some ambient displays. And um, here's one of them, is, which is fizzy light. And the way which it works is that um, there's a simple matrix of LEDs that can be programmed to change patterns or light or pulse or brightness. This one here was fizzy move. And this cube um, simply has a disk on the top that can go clockwise or anti-clockwise, and it can go fast or slow. Um, so these were the basic kit, um, basic boxes, if you like, that we wanted to provide uh, householders to think about what they might do with those. And the way in which we set it up was that they could decide what sensor or what was being sensed to map up with a particular cube. So there were four cubes for this. One was had vibration, one had lights, patterns, one had uh, um, air coming out of it, and the other one um, was with the rotating disk. And simply, you as the user can decide what's being measured. You, you click on a, um, a box, whether it's noise or CO2, and you drag across over to one of those four cubes, and then you set up the parameters. So a parameter might be, if the CO2 level is equal to exhaled breath, then alert me by turning on the fizzy move cube. We wanted to uh, have these uh, end user um, rules in a language that people could understand rather than in numbers that they might not. So what happened? We did a, um, a user study in the wild. We asked a number of families if they would mind um, having the smart citizen and then being given uh, the cubes. So they were given the smart citizen kit um, for a couple of weeks to, and um, just to measure what was happening in the house, and then they could go to the website to see. We then gave them a fizzy kit to see uh, what else they might do. So what happened? What were the main findings? Well, in the first two weeks, there was curiosity about the data being collected. People went and had a look at the website. But then, um, as we'd found before, most people stopped looking at it even um, and just got on with their lives. Then when we came along uh, and gave them the fizzy kit, uh, what we found was that people were very interested in, in what these cubes might do. They made lots of rules. They created lots of rules between um, the cubes and what was being me measured. 
and they placed them around the house. Most people were really interested in uh, noise and humidity, but less interested in gases. And partly you would hope that the level of carbon um, monoxide or nitrogen isn't going to go up and down that will cause your cubes to start being triggered. Um, so um, that's what they were interested in, to see whether they could trigger the cubes um, or that they would be triggered if there was a change in, in those two. So here are some of the uh, types of rules they created over the, the period. As you can see, there was a lot of diversity. I'm not going to go through these in terms of what they matched that's being measured with the, the type of cube. I will just let this little video... This example, the fizzy light is set up to visualize the noise in the house. It is placed next to the television for good visibility to the entire family and is also used as a candle holder. This user has set up the fizzy light to alert whenever the air pollution is too high. She placed the cube on her nightstand and after the fizzy light alerted her, she decides to turn the cube off and continue sleeping. The user placed a basil plant on top of a fizzy move and connected it to an air pollution sensor. As long as the quality is good, the basil will continue to be turned and grow straight up. At the end of the day, the user can tell by the direction of the open leaves if the air quality is okay. The fizzy air is visualizing the temperature in the house. After several alerts, the user decides to investigate and takes her iPad to visit the Smart Citizen website and look at the detailed data. The fizzy bus is positioned on the kitchen counter and connected to the humidity. After cooking for a while, the cube alerts the user that the humidity is too high, causing her to turn on the hood. Okay, so you can see how different households appropriated um, the cubes. Um, in one setting, uh, mum was concerned that her kids were making too much noise and so she used it to measure how loud they were relative to others um, uh, in the neighborhood but found that she was perhaps noisier than her kids. <laughs> so what we found with this uh, uh, way of thinking differently about how you present data to householders um, so that they can be interested and curious is that uh, using this tangible type of representation made it accessible. And that so often that the cubes themselves, when they triggered events, was enough for them to understand what was happening. But sometimes it made people even more curious and that they uh, would drill down and looked at the website to understand a bit more about the data. And I think just taking this approach, not always thinking, can we try and uh, train up the general public to look at dashboards and, and other types of visualizations, um, suggest that we might think of ways in which we can customize and build physical devices that show um, or collect digital data in a variety of other public settings. And we might think of hospitals, we can think of schools, museums, and parks, where those communities could build these types of um, uh, tangibles. They don't have to be cubes, they could be other devices. And so that the data that's collected and shown uh, reflects their level of interest, um, rather than always thinking as a default, we should just provide dashboards of data. And the bottom line here is I think physicality can make data very visible, very poignant, and also it can couple for the user uh, the, where the data is coming from and the context to that event and, and what it means to them. So the, the third case study I want to describe is thinking a bit differently about um, how we can collect data at scale. And it's a project that we conducted in collaboration with people on the Madeira Island in, in, uh, in Portugal. Um, those of you who've ever been there, it's um, a very beautiful uh, volcanic island. And there are now nearly one and a half million tourists who go there every year. It's quite a small island, and there's only about 250,000 people who live there. And so the, the local um, government is concerned about the economic, the ecological, and, and uh, social impact that having so many people come to the island 
Now they have the massive tourist uh, ships that come, cruise ships that come in three or four times a day and offload thousands of people into this small island. So they're worried it's affecting the island's resources and the wildlife. And so they want to have a better idea of, of where do tourists go once they come off the, the, the cruise ships and also um, into the airports. And so um, with some researchers, they set up um, a, an infrastructure to try and track where people go. This infrastructure is a simple uh, passive Wi-Fi hotspot sensing system that can track uh, where people go by picking up uh, um, the unique identifier from their smartphones. It's anonymous, but what it does is it allows them to track where they go and how many and at what time. And it can be then represented as people flows. And so what they're able to do is collect data that shows um, at different parts of the island uh, where people went and how many um, and whether there was peaks and troughs. Now this is okay, it's quite interesting data, um, but they were thinking this isn't, you know, it doesn't really help us understand what people are doing in these places. And that's where we came along. Um, in that we were asked to think about how we might enrich or annotate this data and engage the local uh, people and also the tourists in um, contributing more and maybe even interpreting that data. So would they be interested in, in helping to understand a bit more about how mass tourism is affecting Madeira? Would they provide more information um, to augment the hotspot people flow data? In particular, uh, would they describe what's happening around them and their surroundings? And also, would they be prepared to try and guess what these visualizations meant? What was behind the data, the troughs and the peaks? And if so, how would we do that? What could we design and develop based on our previous um, uh, projects, looking at physicality that might draw in the, the tourists and the general public um, to give um, their responses and be engaged with it. So we didn't want to design another app. We wanted to think a bit more about how we could get uh, people to come in and be interested, curious, and um, uh, engage with the data. So this is what we built, which was uh, what Nick named Romeo. And like the other ones, we wanted to design something that was at a, a novel, that was at a, a human height, that people would come across and think, what's that? Realize that it was collecting data and to be able to answer questions. And the design was public friend, and a friendly interface, uh, in, intended, again, using sliders and buttons that were easy to use. And that passers-by were asked questions about themselves, um, the data that was collected and the surroundings, and they were given the opportunity to simply say yes or no or have open-ended questions. And we thought a lot about what types of questions uh, we might ask people that they would be interested in, but also would help to understand a bit more about um, what tourists did and where they went. So we asked um, what we called contextual questions, which is describe the people around you. Um, uh, do they, how many have moustaches? How many have uh, wearing hats and so on? We also asked what uh, environmental questions, things like what's the current mood around here? Does this place feel busy to you? Getting a better, a more richer picture of what's happening rather than just simply numbers. Um, obviously, we ask questions to do with demographics. Uh, what nationality are you? How often have you been to Madeira? Why are you here? These questions were developed in, in consultation with the, the tourist board and the local authority um, as to what might be appropriate. Um, then some questions about data. Why does the airport get busier from May? Why are there more people in the port? Why is it quieter? And so on. We also asked um, a number of factual questions. Um, what's the wettest month of the year? Just to see whether or not people are answering sensibly. And um, we placed um, Romeo um, in Funchal, which is the capital of um, Madeira, um, near to the tourist center. And again, we didn't stand there and say, come on, come and answer the questions. We just waited to see whether people would walk up to it, approach it, and think about, um, would I like to answer these questions? And we found, again, many people walked up, used it, whether they were in pairs, whether they were in groups or by themselves or in families. And over a five-day deployment, there were over 500 people uh, took, um, decided to use it. 
Many people looked on and waited, but because people spent often up to five minutes or more, um, they decided not to carry on waiting, but they, they went on. So potentially we could have had more people using it. Because this was in Portugal, we gave them the opportunity to answer in English or Portuguese. And so you can see uh, that uh, a number of people answered in Portuguese, suggesting that it wasn't just the tourists on the big ships coming from um, Europe and, and further afar. Um, we also found that uh, a lot of people just answered yes, no, but there were some who answered, uh, ty typed in um, their answers. And sometimes it was found that the public were more accurate than the sensor data. So they were asked uh, how many people uh, each day come into the airport, and most people said 3,000 for that particular month. However, uh, the actual hotspot Wi-Fi analysis was 40 one day and it suggested it was 7,000. So it was possible that they were able to be more accurate than, than the um, automated system. So this just goes to show, again, how long they took to answer questions. Some people actually came back with other members of their group to show them and to answer more. And they were also able to provide some suggestions as to what was behind the data, these data visualizations had been collected. So when um, something like this was presented, why is the central part of Funchal so busy at 10 o'clock? Uh, many of them said, bolo do cacao. And if you've been to uh, uh, Madeira, will know that this is a traditional Portuguese bread that's sold at that particular point, And everyone goes there to buy it. It's not sold at other times. Again, uh, they were able to answer uh, questions like why are there more people at the airport on Mondays? Um, and some of them suggested it's because of more incoming tourists or um, business flights. Why does it get busier in the, in the area from May onwards? Again, some suggested it was uh, more events in May and there are more tourists. These are kind of fairly straightforward questions. And some other ones they found more difficult. But we wanted to see whether people were prepared to have a look at visualizations and think what was going on. So opening up the tourist data, just like uh, with the previous case studies with opening up environmental data, what we found was that having this physical interactive installation was very good at attracting the public uh, who would approach it. And then they were willing to uh, contribute more data and they felt comfortable doing so. Um, and they were curious about the, the people flow visualizations where people were going across the island. But they were quite limited in their ability to, to map um, these to actual events. So this suggests that you know, our, our hope that they could become data detectives may be not the case because it's difficult to imagine yourself um, what was happening there, say, um, a week ago or yesterday even. The tourist board uh, and the local authorities were really excited by this approach and they came up with new questions to ask that they hadn't thought of before. And so to just to summarize, we think that this approach to engaging the general public um, in a voluntary way to give um, descriptions of what they're seeing and to answer questions can generate a, a richer picture of what's happening on the island rather than just getting automated uh, people flows that you can get from doing this Wi-Fi uh, hotspot analysis. Okay, I'm just going to um, come to the end um, of my talk now, which is some of the, the lessons learned from these three case studies was that very visible look at me types of displays and technologies are attractive to the general public. They'll come up, they're curious, they'll approach them, and they're if they're accessible, they feel comfortable interacting and providing um, responses. The use of colorful, physical, and simple inf interfaces, um, which um, I hope you've seen through, through those three, um, makes it easy for people to feel that it's okay for them to have a go. They're not worried that, uh, that they might make a fool of themselves or they won't know how to answer the questions. Showing others uh, what, how others have responded seems to be a really key way by which people um, are intrigued and curious um, and it gets them reflecting about their behaviors. And then people are much more interested in data that they can connect with. That's what we saw with the Physikit, uh, with what's happening in their own lives. And then creating a sense of ownership towards the data can make people curious. So just to recap, I think these physical interfaces, there's a lot to be said about designing something that's colorful, that's um, attractive, 
in terms of provoking curiosity and using familiar inputs like sliders and, and knobs and dials. There's something about that experience of doing that rather than just clicking on radio buttons that makes people want to do more. They can also see how many questions there are to answer rather than there being potentially hundreds on an online survey. So just to um, summarize, I started my talk uh, by uh, saying what's happening um, in some aspects of, uh, of society in terms of how we can collect data and how creepy that might be. And clearly this is on the rise. Whether you think it's creepy or not depends on your perspective of whether you're the one who's the company that's trying to introduce a new service. Um, but I argue I think we need more user studies um, to explore what people are comfortable with, um, and especially with AI analysis um, that try and um, um, analyze and interpret and infer people's expressions without them knowing or their consent. Um, also, I think researchers should take um, risks, um, more risks to reveal, because I think just asking people, may not, you may not get the whole picture. And conducting breaching experiments, like I, I described at the beginning, is one approach. And human beings are very um, naturally very curious, and that's what I think we've shown in all of our studies. So let's try and tap into this by enlisting them to collect and interpret um, their own data in conjunction with AI approaches. I think I'm not against AI approaches. I think you know, they have a lot to offer, but we need to think about how people, humans, can understand these, interact with them, and feel um, that they are comfortable and they accept how they're being used. So on that note, I think I will finish and say thank you very much to all my colleagues and collaborators. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, so, in your census, um, one, you have, I remember you had the option for people to like say what kind of, uh, like, you want to share family or, or like with your friends or like, or, or like the government, etc. Um, I was wondering, like, do people differ significantly in like who they want to share it with based on like their own demographics and stuff like that, right? Because that would like indicate a potential problem with this approach of like, of like, of like asking users for a lot of consent and not doing creepy data collection, right? Because like you have bias in like who you're getting data on. Um, I don't think we found any systematic differences between how the types of questions that were asked and whether people felt comfortable sharing this. Certainly there were some differences, but nothing systematic. Um, so uh, that I think was one thing we were really interested in, in seeing whether or not people, you know, would be feel most uncomfortable if their family and friends knew that they were having unprotected sex or something like that. But because it was anonymous, uh, the, and, and in that setting it was hypothetical, but if it was in a real uh, context, you might find that people would be quite different about who it was going to be shared with. But we were just exploring whether, uh, um, how much they would, you know, how far they were prepared to let that information be shared. So I'm curious about the um, issues with, um, I don't know if it's about ethics of the research or just criticism of the research. I've observed certain parts, at least, of the HCI community will say, oh, we think this is an invasion of privacy or something, and, and we'll kind of criticize the work and not want you to even do it. And I, you know, I've been on panels with people with this attitude, and I'm wondering whether that's actually a real mistake, because only by building these systems and seeing how people really react can we understand what are the right lines to draw versus just hypothetically going, hey, people won't like that or that is inappropriate. So I'm wondering, if, is some of these kind of probes almost that you're doing allowing you to get at that, and was that also some of the issues with that Kai paper that was held up? Yeah, I think we have an aversion to harming people. And so ethics, you know, it's very easy to get on your uh, pedestal and say what's right and what's wrong, and we should protect vulnerable people and so on and so forth. But these technologies are coming out which are much more insidious. And I, and I, 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 I'm in total agreement with you that I think we need these kinds, of, we need to do these kinds of studies, just like 10 years ago when uh, fishing experiments, as in P-H-I-S-H, 
started to uh, be conducted to show just how gullible and how trusting people were when an email was sent to them uh, from the, what looked like their bank saying, could you please give me details? And um, people just filled all of that in. And so uh, I think we need now, because of all of these new technologies that are coming out, to do more experiments to look at the uh, what people's reactions are. Simply to say that's unethical doesn't mean to say it's going to go away. It's going to be there. It's not HCI researchers. It will be others who are developing this. So uh, that's why I'm suggesting we need to think about, uh, you know, let's not just sort of say, well, we're not going to do that. We need to make sure our algorithms are transparent and ethical. Um, other people won't think that. And so sometimes people don't mind and sometimes they do. And I think that boundary between what is a, the privacy boundary between what's comfortable, people are comfortable with and not will change and vary uh, uh, depending on generation, on culture and so on. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, but I do think that within the HCI community, it's much easier to, to get on your pedestal and say, we, we, we want to be protective of all of this, um, and without realizing that you're actually denying doing some really important research. Uh, my question is regarding the tourist level data that you talked about. Um, so that was kind of a self-report data that you were using, right? So we can also find similar data on, on several websites, like let's say Twitter or TripAdvisor. So uh, what's your take on uh, kind of analyzing data which is already shared publicly? Uh, yeah. I think crowdsourcing and sentiment analysis is also a very valuable methodology that we're starting to use in HCI. So that could complement this uh, um, by asking people. But it requires them to go online, um, whether they've got a phone or um, you know, they're at a, a PC or a laptop. What, the, what this approach um, is, is that people just stumbling across it. You get quite different types of people, diversity. So those people who tend to um, go online and, and want to help others out through crowdsourcing may be more homogenous. And so I think this allows for a richer diversity by just happening to, to come across something um, whilst you're there. So I think it complements. I wouldn't say one or the other. I think each of these methods can provide um, more information um, and a better picture. Certainly with, with crowdsourcing, you get many more, but do you get that diversity? And I think that's quite interesting to, to explore. But I think my point is that we shouldn't just always be going for more um, autonomous systems that, does it, that do everything for us because it's easy. We can just put more sensors out there. We've got this other one. They're not necessarily reliable or accurate, but they only give you a particular line through what's happening. So yes, I think there are other methods as well. Someone over here. Yeah. I have a question. How, how did you, what's the process of like, uh, uh, designing these like, you know, probes? Uh, how do you select the right probe? Because you know you can induce biases on the person. You know a, a probe can be an intervention by itself and may actually generate a change. How do you discuss this? Like, should I do like you know a thing that's less square versus less square, or whatever? You know, I would like, it's, I'm just curious. You know, sure. what's the process of getting to to the end piece? That we I think there's a bit of like? creativity, a bit of serendipity, a lot of uh, prototyping in the lab. Uh, I hire professional interaction designers who understand you know, and are inspired about what's the best way to design something physical um, like uh, the Fizzy Kit and so on. So um, it's interaction design writ large um, that often goes on. In terms of whether we, you know, we developed our first uh, what was called Voxbox, which is this very large um, uh, interactive um, questionnaire um, that was physical, and that was so successful that that led us to design a whole range of other um, physical questionnaires. Um, and that was partly, uh, yeah, we just had one of those aha moments, let's try it like that. And I think partly that's what, you know, when you're doing design, you don't really know what, you know, what you're going to come up with. But then we do the sort of post hoc analysis of why did this work? Why didn't this work? Why did people um, um, come up to it? Why did, you know, they ignore it or so on? 
The Romeo, we've been thinking a lot about anthropomorphism, how much and how little you might introduce. So it had a bow tie, and it was just, and then in these eyes, just a little bit, not trying to make it into a robot, but just a little bit. We had hoped it would be able to move around so it could go up to people and they might use it, but anyone who does work in robotics knows that's notoriously difficult before it falls over. So we decided to keep it stationary. So yes, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes about thinking about, you know, even just the sliders, the buttons, and so on, and, and and that's the joy and pleasure of people who do interaction design and graphic design and physical product design. You've already asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about the Quincy cubes. You are saying how the mechanical display uh, attracted more attention from people. Um, I'm wondering if we just have the same amount of Quincy cubes but replace them with like touch screens and make them the same level of present and accessible in people's homes, would they still achieve the same level of user engagement? Um, we didn't do a test to see whether if you just went for default tablets. I think there's something about having uh, artifacts in your home uh, that you um, you can um, customize or dress up or put there. So when you have visitors come, you can explain what that is. If you just have a tablet, you don't have that association or that attachment. In one of our first studies where we were looking at how we could get um, people to use the stairs rather than the elevator, we put twinkly lights in the carpet. So as they walked along, the twinkly lights came along and it lured them to use the stairs. People carried on using those for a year. They became very attached to these twinkly lights. And whenever they had visitors, they would show them, they would dance with them and so on. It became part of the furniture. So I think these cubes, you can dress them up, you can put plants on them they create a very different uh, relationship that the person can have. So I don't think you would get that necessarily with a tablet. Also tablets you tend to, you know, you take them to, to do other things on. They are multi-function, uh, multi-task, whereas these cubes are very much just about, this has been programmed to show you when noise level is high or when uh, the temperature or the moisture levels are high. So they serve a specific purpose. They're not like a tablet that could be used for anything. Tablets get lost. Kids take them into their bedrooms. So I would probably say that we, sh you know, you could probably get the same functionality, but you'd get a very different experience. Right. A final question, please. Oh, sorry. Could you talk a little bit more about the impact of legislation and regulation in your research, especially the GDPR in Europe? Sorry, could you say that again? If you could talk a little bit more about the legislation and regulation in this collection of data, especially the GDPR in Europe, General Data Protection Regulation. No, I couldn't. It's such a difficult question, have... that one. Uh, I think there is changing the legislation about uh, what data is uh, being able to be collected. Um, that's, uh, that's beyond the scope of, of my knowledge, sorry. Further questions, Yvonne will be up here. Please uh, crowd around and you know ask her whatever you're interested in. Uh, we'd like to thank her one more time for coming. Today.